Hi, I'm Linda Moulton Howe. Since graduating from Stanford University, where I produce documentaries about medicine and science, I have investigated the world with the pressure of fact. I am a truth hunter on this planet, this solar system, and the universe beyond. I began investigating worldwide bloodless animal mutilations in September 1979, and to my great surprise, a sheriff and other law enforcement told me, quote, the perpetrators are creatures from outer space, close quote. Now in the 21st century, we have rovers exploring Mars and solar system spacecraft showing us the first close-up images of Pluto's icy mountains and the bright white magnesium salt deposits in a crater on the dwarf planet Ceres and news that at the bottom of the six mile deep ocean at the South Pole on Saturn's moon Enceladus, there is hot water at nearly 200 degrees Fahrenheit gushing from the seafloor and spouting through the surface ice, apparently heated by radioactive material in the core. That provokes scientists to wonder if there could be swimming creatures in that surprisingly warm moon water. As the future rushes toward us with a mixture of lies and truths, I would like to sharpen focus on what was actually happening right after the end of World War II, when the front page of the Roswell Daily Record on July 8, 1947 was headlined, quote, Roswell Army Airfield captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. No details of flying disc are revealed, close quote. We now know that during a thunderstorm late at night on July 3rd to 4th, 1947, three aerial objects merged on radar before three crash sites were reported. The headline about one of those crashes came from Colonel William Blanchard, commanding officer of the 509th Bomb Wing at the Roswell Army Airfield. Colonel Blanchard ordered his public information officer, Walter Hogg, to issue a press release that said one of those flying saucers that people had been reporting that summer had crashed northwest of Roswell near Corona. Strange debris had been found by sheep rancher Mac Brazel on July 4th. Three days later, on July 7th, the head of the Roswell Army Airfield's 509th Bomber Group Intelligence Unit, Lieutenant Colonel Jesse Marcel Sr., went to the Brazel Ranch with Counterintelligence Corps agent Sheridan Cavett. They wanted to investigate, and they gathered up peculiar silver foil that folded like cloth and sprang back to perfect flatness. There were also long, thin I-beams with purple symbols on them. The next day, on July 8th, after the story broke on the front page of the Roswell Daily Record, the head of the 8th Air Force in Fort Worth, Texas, Brigadier General Roger Ramey, held a press conference with his chief of staff, Colonel Thomas DuBose, to falsely say there was no flying saucer. It was just a weather balloon that exploded in the thunderstorm. To strengthen his phony story, General Ramey had pieces of shredded weather balloon spread on the floor to be photographed so newspapers would run with his concocted story, specifically to keep the public and the media from knowing about the alien presence. Even Lieutenant Colonel Jesse Marcel Sr. was asked to fly from Roswell to Fort Worth to pose for photographs amid actual weather balloon debris. But Colonel Marcel knew that what he had gathered the day before from the Brazel Ranch was not a weather balloon. Five years later, 1952, President Truman's Majestic 12 Special Panel produced their first annual report that described, quote, unidentified plan form space vehicles, close quote. Plan form meant a delta or crescent shape, not a round disk. Here are paragraphs six and seven from MJ-12's 1952 report, quote, radar film and tower logs do not explain the merging of three radar targets prior to collision and subsequent crashes. There were five recovered bodies. 
two of which were found in a severely damaged escape cylinder, and the remaining three bodies were found some distance away from the cylinder. All five appeared to have suffered from sudden decompression and heat suffocation." Close quote. So there were three radar targets and three crash sites that MJ-12 called landing zones one, two, and three. Landing zone one was near Corona, New Mexico, about 75 miles northwest of Roswell. The same month of the crashes, another U.S. government agency with the provocative title Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit summarized on July 22, 1947, what had been found at those three crash sites. Paragraph 12 stated, quote, the most disturbing aspect of this investigation was there were other bodies found not far from landing zone one that looked as if they had been dissected as you would a frog, close quote. No explanation was given about whether the dissected bodies were animal, human, or alien. And then came this startling sentence, quote, animal parts were reportedly discovered inside the craft at landing zone two, close quote. Landing zone two was 20 miles southeast of Socorro, not far from Oscura Peak, southeast of the Trinity site in White Sands Proving Ground, where the United States tested its first atomic bomb two years earlier in July, 1945. Those animal parts were reportedly found inside a well-preserved capsule. It might have been ejected from the crash vehicle at landing zone one near Corona. Landing zone three was 30 miles east of Alamogordo on the Mescalero Apache Indian Reservation. That third UFO hit the ground hard and was badly damaged. Remember that the Majestic 12 Project's first annual report in 1952 used the word plan form to describe crescent-shaped alien craft, not round disks. Well, here is a photograph of one of those plan forms that the photographer told me reminded him of a man's shoe heel. William A. Rhodes had been a flight instructor during World War II at Falcons Field in Phoenix, Arizona. When he saw this shoe heel in the sky, Bill Rhodes grabbed his box camera to take this photograph. The date was July 7, 1947, the same week of the other three UFO crashes in New Mexico. Two days later, on Wednesday, July 9, 1947, the Arizona Republic in Phoenix put the Rhodes photograph of the crescent-shaped aerial plan form on its front page, but it got it upside down. The same plan form shape has been described by other retired military eyewitnesses of crescent-shaped UFOs. General Roger Ramey's goal was to carry out President Harry Truman's orders for a strict policy of denial and secrecy about the alien crashes. Allegedly, Truman and FDR had already dealt with a UFO and three dead aliens six full years before. In a 2015 book entitled Mo 41, standing for Missouri 1941, The Bombshell Before Roswell, author Paul Blake Smith writes that on the night of April 12, 1941, a crescent-shaped UFO crashed near Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Cape Girardeau is 115 miles southeast of St. Louis, and near there was the Missouri Institute for Aeronautics in Sykeston. Allegedly, military personnel from MIA retrieved a crescent-shaped craft and three identical small bodies described as not from this world, and they were found on a farm about eight miles south of Cape Girardeau. Today, we would call those identical bodies clones. One U.S. government document leaked in the 1990s to aerospace engineer Dr. Robert Wood is entitled, quote, MJ-12 Project White Hot Intelligence Estimate 
a preliminary dated September 19, 1947. That's only two and a half months after the UFO crashes around Roswell. Classified Magic Eyes Only, Part 3, Scientific Probability states, quote, Based on all available evidence collected from recovered exhibits, meaning the planform UFOs, currently under study, and then comes a list of 11 government and military agencies and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Those craft are deemed extraterrestrial in nature. This conclusion was reached as a result of comparisons of artifacts from the Missouri discovery in 1941, meaning Cape Girardeau. The technology is outside the scope of U.S. science. It is even outside that of German rocket and aircraft development, close quote. Part two, technical evaluation, paragraph 18 states, quote, the following elements were analyzed and found to exist in the small neutronic power plant that was found inside U-Lot 1, close quote. Now U-Lot 1 is another acronym for UFO plan form. This one stands for unidentified lenticular shaped aerodyne. Continuing from the September 19, 1947 White Hot Intelligence Briefing, it says, quote, even the recovery case of 1941, Cape Girardeau, it did not create a unified intelligence effort to exploit possible technological gains with the exception of the Manhattan Project, close quote. The reference to the Manhattan Project means physicist Robert Oppenheimer had the Cape Girardeau neutronic power plant to study during his development of the atomic bomb that we first dropped on Japan in August 1945, ending World War II. That also implies the presidents Roosevelt and Truman already knew about an alien presence during World War II, before the July 1947 Roswell crashes. And they had made a decision to keep everything secret about UFOs, the alien bodies they had retrieved, both dead and alive. Much of the content in those early reports was drawn from what Lieutenant General Nathan Twining discovered on his secret mission for President Truman soon after the New Mexico crashes. That's when General Twining viewed the five alien bodies and craft found at Landing Zone 2 near Oscura Peak and the Trinity site. In 1947, General Twining was commander of the Air Material Command. Ten years later, President Eisenhower would appoint him chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. By July 16, 1947, only one week after the Roswell Daily Headline, General Twining sent President Truman a two-page report about what he saw for himself at the Landing Zone 2 crash site near Oscura Peak, and that was on the White Sands Proving Ground. Quote, Upon examination of the interior of the craft, a compartment exhibiting a possible atomic engine was discovered. In the power room was a donut-shaped tube approximately 35 feet in diameter made of what appears to be a plastic material that is surrounding a central core. This tube was translucent, approximately one inch thick. The tube appeared to be filled with a clear substance, possibly a heavy water. This activation of electrical potential is believed to be the primary power to the reactor, though it is only a theory at present. Just how a heavy water reactor functions in this environment is unknown. On the deck of the power room, there are what resembles typewriter keys, possibly reactor power plant controls. There were no conventional electronics nor wiring to be seen connecting these controls to the propulsion turret. I have been told those keys had strange hieroglyphic type symbols on them. The 1952 MJ-12 first annual report said, quote, the technology may be eons ahead of us, close quote, meaning thousands of years beyond us on Earth. Another military insider from World War II and the Eisenhower and Kennedy presidencies 
did a 1997 book entitled The Day After Roswell. It was about what he knew firsthand of UFO extraterrestrial technologies and ETs while he was working in the Pentagon. Lieutenant Colonel Philip J. Corso worked as chief of the Pentagon's foreign technology desk for General Arthur Trudeau. He was handpicked by President Dwight Eisenhower in 1958 to be director of Army Research and Development in the Pentagon. General Trudeau, on the right, handpicked Colonel Corso after their trusted days together in World War II. Colonel Corso told me he met with General Trudeau in his Pentagon office where the general handed over extraterrestrial artifacts retrieved from crashed or landed UFOs. The general asked Colonel Corso to secretly hand deliver ET artifacts to selected contacts in a few American corporations. General Trudeau and President Eisenhower wanted the ET technologies back engineered and patented as a top secret national security priority. No one, not in Congress, the Supreme Court, or the tax-paying American public was to know anything. General Trudeau and Colonel Corso were the beginning of the United States' serious efforts to develop a secret space program that would use retrieved extraterrestrial technology for advancement. Meanwhile, NASA was created on July 29, 1958, allegedly as a public agency, but insiders have long reported that NASA has been under CIA control from the beginning. NASA would be the public camouflage for what was behind the scenes, a dark and growing underbelly of American secret authorities not accountable to either congressional oversight or to the American people. These above top secret entities controlled billions, trillions of dollars behind an untouchable intelligence and counterintelligence matrix designed to keep the whole world from knowing about the alien presence on Earth. In June 1997, Time Magazine did a cover story on the 50th anniversary of the Roswell crashes. I was there to speak for that 50th commemoration. And there I met and talked with Colonel Corso about his work for General Trudeau. When Colonel Corso was introduced to me, he extended his hand to shake mine as he said, how the hell did you get so much classified information? He meant the animal mutilations that I had investigated for my TV documentary, A Strange Harvest. That was first broadcast May 28, 1980 on Denver CBS station KMGH-TV. That is where I was director of special projects. And that is when sheriffs and ranchers told me the perpetrators of the bloodless, trackless animal deaths were, quote, creatures from outer space, close quote. Ranchers had seen glowing lights in night skies emit beams down into their pastures. A few had even seen a cow lifted up in a beam of light or lowered to pastures dead and mutilated. But none of those eyewitnesses would stand in front of my TV camera for fear of ridicule. Before he died, Colonel Corso talked to me in private about the highly classified documents that he had read in Washington, D.C., dated as early as 1951 about animals found in several parts of the world with bloodless excisions and no tracks around them. Colonel Corso said the classified reports that he read specified that the perpetrators of animal mutilations were, quote, extraterrestrial biological entities, close quote. But why? This illustration is by a Missouri horse rancher in 1975 who saw this glowing being at his gate during a time when he found several newborn foals and young horses bloodlessly mutilated in his pasture. Eventually, our government would realize that many of the UFO pilots and other non-human entities were cloned androids or human ET hybrids produced from genetic harvests of Earth life, including animal mutilations and extractions of human sperm and eggs. 
Our government, according to Colonel Corso, learned that in spite of the mutilations and abductions, some ETs are friendly and they want humanity to advance faster, to be more protected from unfriendly ETs. So there was urgency in General Trudeau's goal to get alien technologies back engineered and patented as fast as possible, to keep them from Germany and Russia, and to support a secret space program that might have to do battle in real Star Wars. About secret ET technology transfer to American corporations for back engineering and patents, Colonel Corso wrote, quote, General Trudeau also had relationships with the Army contractors who were developing new weapon systems for the military within one part of the company, while another highly secret part of the company was harvesting some of the same ET technology for consumer product development. And these were companies such as Bell Labs, IBM, Monsanto, Dow, RCA, that became General Electric, and the aviation and medical companies of Howard Hughes, close quote. At that July 1997 50th anniversary conference, Dr. Jesse Marcel Jr. handed me this replica of the thin I-beam that he remembered holding in the first week of July 1947. That's when his father, Jesse Marcel Sr., the head of intelligence at the Roswell Army Airfield, woke up Jesse and his mother to show them pieces of the strange silver foil and I-beams that Jesse Marcel Sr. had picked up at one of the three UFO crash sites that first week of July 1947. And that was the one between Roswell and Corona. Jesse Marcel Sr. said the metallic foil was like cloth that could be folded or crumpled up and it would always return to its original, flat, unwrinkled shape. Jesse Jr. told me his father said that the debris, quote, was not of this earth, close quote. Young Jesse Marcel was so curious about what he described as metallic pinkish purple hieroglyphs or symbols that ran along the entire length of a tan-colored I-beam only three-eighths of an inch wide. The I-beam was so lightweight that Jesse Jr. said he could hardly feel it in his hand. Plastics did not exist publicly in 1947, but eyewitnesses would later on compare the I-beams to new lightweight plastic or balsa wood. There were rumors that scientists had discovered the I-beams were an exotic hybrid of metal-like wood. It could not be cut, it could not be burned. Intelligence officer Jesse Marcel Sr. would himself compare the strange pink-purple symbols to, quote, indecipherable Chinese writing, close quote. Twelve years after the 1947 Roswell UFO cover-up began, Brigadier General Stephen Lufkin said that he was briefed in the Pentagon in 1959 about the Roswell UFO crashes, and he was shown thin I-beams with what he called purplish encryptions. That word means encoding messages or information in such a way that only authorized parties can read it. Another source, Steve Lytle, reported that his mathematician father was asked by government authorities to, quote, decipher the I-beam symbols, close quote. But no one was able to, and those weren't the only mysterious symbols to show up on UFOs. In 1803, on the east coast of Japan in the Hitachi province, fishermen reported that a pale, red-headed, alien-looking woman suddenly emerged from under the ocean waters in a round craft that had symbols on its surface. The woman was inside the craft clutching a box. Eyewitnesses called her Utsuro Bune, meaning ship hole, because her sea craft was shaped like a rice bowl. People who saw the craft said the top was like glass or crystal. And when the red-haired woman spoke, it was in a language that no Japanese person had ever heard before. What language was she speaking? Where did she come from? What was in the box? Nobody knows. 
Eyewitnesses claim the same red-haired woman and craft were reported in other parts of Japan as if she were flying around in the craft. She was always reported to be tightly holding that box. 177 years later, on December 26, 1980, after midnight, Staff Sergeant James Penniston at RAF Bentwaters Woodbridge in England would also encounter a strange craft with symbols in Rendlesham Forest. When Sergeant Penniston dragged his fingers over the symbols, his mind was filled with zeros and ones of binary code and telepathic impressions of a time machine from a distant future where an advanced civilization was dying out. Its mission was to harvest genetic material from Earth to use as band-aids to extend the future of civilization survival. There was no pilot. The triangular craft operated with alien self-activating software. Now, here is a comparison of two Utsuro Bune symbols marked with red circles that are variations on the Jim Penniston triangle and circle symbols in the lower left. We're going to see this triangle circle symbol again in a 2015 UFO encounter. But first, on August 28, 1991, 11 years after Sergeant Penniston touched the symbols on the alien craft in Rendlesham Forest, Soviet authorities were tracking a UFO on a zigzag course at 4,225 miles an hour. The rapid radar track vanished over Kyrgyzstan. A year later, in June 1992, a search party found a cylinder-shaped craft with strange green symbols on it. The investigation reported, quote, powerful electromagnetic field emanating from the wreckage, close quote. All photographs and videotape recordings were overexposed. The craft had crashed in the Shaitan Mazar Gorge, also known as the Devil's Grave, in the central Tian Shan Mountains of eastern Kyrgyzstan. Then 14 years after that, in late June 2015, an army sergeant with his wife, two young children, dog and a cat, began moving from Hunter Army Airfield near Richmond Hill, Georgia, on the Atlantic Ocean to Fort Carson in Colorado Springs, planning to go through Atlanta. He set his truck's GPS for the route and they planned to travel at night when it was cooler with less traffic and then they would stay in motels during the day. The husband, Sergeant CJ, I call him, and his wife were shocked when a bright white light in the sky suddenly came down toward their truck. The Army sergeant estimated that the disc covering above their truck was 820 feet long. That's nearly three football fields and was 200 feet high from base to top. Bright white sparks projected out beyond the craft front and back. Below the midline, there was a row of five dark colored symbols. He told me, quote, in the Army, I'm a trained observer. I've been doing this for 15 years. I'm able to identify high velocity rounds as well as mortars, rockets, artillery, aircraft, all types of aircraft. I'm trained to do that for whatever comes down in front of us on military missions. This huge craft was way beyond anything that I have been trained for, close quote. Sergeant CJ's wife remembered the UFO's surface glistened like an oil slick of rainbow colors when it tilted toward them. And she also thought that there were round lights around the perimeter. The encounter was from exactly 125 to 129 a.m. Eastern on the early morning of June 29, 2015. And this is according to Sergeant CJ's digital watch that he looked at when the craft disappeared by blinking out in front of them. It blinked out, it did not move. The couple felt confused and disoriented. Sergeant CJ drove up the road a few miles and he found a Shake Rag Express on Highway 1 South. When he tried to get out of the truck, he said his legs felt like wet noodles, as if he couldn't stand up and he didn't know what was wrong. But the greater shock was when he bought some food, the Shake Rag Express receipt showed 
They were in Wadley, Georgia, way off their GPS course to Atlanta. The couple had no idea how were they diverted north without realizing it from their GPS. It was programmed. It was a program route that should have taken four and a half hours for the 250 mile drive from Richmond Hill, Georgia via Route 16 to Route 75 into Atlanta. But what happened next implies that the diversion on Route 1 North to the countryside of Wadley, Georgia was under the control of an alien intelligence in order to transmit binary information into Sergeant CJ's mind. Sergeant CJ had the shock of his life, and we'll go deeper into that shock on the next Truth Hunter. This is Linda Moulton Howe. Please stay tuned to my Gaia series for more surprises about our universe, this solar system, and the planet we live on.